Funding for this program is provided by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of the complete line of Cajun King seafood seasoning mixes and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Ah, Louisiana. Hello, I'm Chef John Foles, welcoming you to this great state of ours. We're real proud of our people, places, and food, and I'd like for you to know a little bit more about it. So join me and some of my friends as we visit the historical food towns of this state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. everybody and welcome to A Taste of Louisiana. I'm Chef John Fulson. and today we're looking at some of the historical food towns of Louisiana. Fact is, if you're into history or culture as I am, today is the best day for you to stop and visit right here in my kitchen. Can you imagine that over 4,000 years ago in the northeast section of our state there was a thriving civilization that existed? Fact is, that was 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. That was at the time that Ramesses II was sitting on the throne of Egypt. And that was even before the Roman Empire, right here in Louisiana, a thriving civilization. Today, we're going to go up to Poverty Point, Louisiana. That's right outside of Tallulah in Delhi to see one of these historical towns. Fact is, this is Poverty Point, a 400-acre archaeological site, one of the most important in North America today. We're looking at the museum and entrance center. Fact is, every day, hundreds of school children from all over the state and country come to visit this great site where digs are going on right as we stand here today. Uh, here is a, a site. Here's the site from the air. You can see uh, in this NASA photograph these six concentric circles, and this represents mounds of dirt that were hauled here thousands of years ago to build the actual little city itself. This is a prehistoric subdivision. From the ground level, of course, you can hardly see anything. It, it just looks like, I guess, any other flat plain, and that's why it wasn't discovered until 1953. Here some of the children are walking up to the bird mound, which was probably one of the uh, areas where the religious uh, ceremonies took place. This is 700 feet by 800 feet long. This observation tower allows any of the visitors to watch as the park rangers give demonstrations on how the atlatl and the spear were actually thrown at about 95 miles an hour to harvest game out of the wilderness country of Louisiana. Uh, here again in the museum, you can see the children that just walking around and looking in all the little uh, uh, display cases. Notice the arrow has. This is the projectile points that went on the front of those spears. And when you think that there was no rock whatsoever in this part of Louisiana, you can imagine it all had to be brought in. This is bowlers or plummets that were used uh, to twirl over the head of the natives to capture animals. Here's some more just weights and projectile points that were brought in uh, as this uh, civilization thrived. Here we have copper that had to come in from the Great Lakes region. And imagine all of these nice uh, stones carved prove that there were artisans in that area. This is a Louisiana uh, lotus blossom. And notice the uh, beads and trinkets here. This had to be a very ornamental people. Copper, look at the little copper rings. Effigies of all types. This is a claw effigy. And one of the most interesting thing, this is a woman's body uh, with the head snapped off. And these were found basically in the rummage uh, uh, pits where the garbage was thrown out. It was probably a part of uh, some type of fertility rite. The heads were always snapped off of these little bitty figurines of uh, what appeared to be pregnant women. You can see this nice shot with the heads. But look at the detail. Uh, Again, more of the, uh, uh, the little jewelry. This is the owl, the big pot belly owls, and these had tremendous significance in that there were only one or two of these found in each site, meaning that probably the chieftain wore this particular owl. Can you imagine this? 
just right outside of Delhi, Louisiana, in the little town of Epps, this 400-acre site that is presently being excavated, and archaeologists from all over the world and students from universities all over North America are coming in to dig and find out exactly what happened on the plains of North Louisiana at the time that Moses was leading the Israelites out of Egypt into the Promised Land. Tremendously interesting, and visiting with me in just a little bit will be Dennis Labatt, who's not only a park ranger there, but he's the manager of that site, very good friend of mine, and we're going to cut up in the kitchen just a little bit. But first, I want to cook a couple things from that area. The first thing I want to do for you is a really nice dish of the uh, northeast Louisiana area. This is going to be a casserole of squash and venison. And the reason I chose this dish is because, of course, the venison is the game dish of North Louisiana. And, of course, Poverty Point had to survive on a lot of the game that was in that area. And then, of course, all of the vegetables, the squash and the pumpkin and the sweet potato and the corn and the fresh herbs and vegetables were part of that early culture. So what we're going to do is begin by putting just a little bit oil down into my black iron pot. And this oil, you can use any oil you like. This is just a vegetable oil, but please use whatever oil you want to normally use in your kitchen. I'm going to go ahead and season the venison with a little bit salt, a little bit cracked black pepper, because, of course, I like to season all of this up. And I'm going to saute the venison down into the bottom of the pot until it gets nice and brown. Now, of course, as you uh, saute this uh, venison, you want to get it to the point of almost being slightly, what I like to refer to as whited out. You just want to kind of uh, get that red color off of the meat. And you can see how quickly, if you look at this piece of meat, you can see how quickly it becomes opaque on the outside. That's basically all that I want to do with this venison dish. Just go ahead and saute it lightly to just seal in all of the natural juices. You want to also remember that game does not have a lot of natural marbling. So you want to cook it uh, to a point where it's not so well done that all the juices are gone. But by searing it like this, you can certainly keep a lot of the juices in. Okay, that's stirred around. Now, of course, even 4,000 years ago, if I would have been around, I would have had to use some onion, celery, bell pepper. Yep, you know all of my great spices, a little bit of all these fresh seasonings as we do in Louisiana today, onions, celery, and of course, people always ask me about my measuring technique. Everybody knows that I don't really measure. I don't think cooks in general measure a lot. If you know what you're doing, just go ahead and throw it all in there. Now, I'll saute that around for a second, just until I wilt all of the vegetables into the pot. And once they're wilted, then I would add all of the rest of my ingredients from that part of North Louisiana. Of course, beautiful pumpkin. I'm going to put a couple hands of cubed punk pumpkin down into the pot. Some Louisiana yams, some wild sweet potatoes were found growing, uh, I mean, cooked on the Poverty Point site. So I know that that was around. And of course, some squash seeds were also found there. But uh, I'm even adding a little corn because I know that that was a big part of our early Louisiana cooking. Look at all these pretty vegetables going down into the pot. I've got the onion, celery, bell pepper. I've got the venison. And now, of course, all of the pumpkin and corn and all those other wonderful things. At that point, at this point, I'm going to add just a little bit stock. I could add chicken stock, beef stock, any kind of stocks. But I'm going to add, at this point, a little bit chicken stock because I want to just simmer, or basically pot roast, as I'm going to do with my next dish, pot roast that venison in all of those nice flavors. I can add some herbs. I'm going to put a few little pieces of thyme down in there, even a little sprig of rosemary, because this obviously has some uh, influence from the Spanish. And then some of these nice little red peppers. Look how pretty that is. These are little cayenne peppers and some bay leaves. I can continue to season with a little bit Louisiana hot sauce. And then, of course, a dash of my sassafras or ground filet powder, and then a little salt and pepper into the stock. And I would allow this to cook on a really nice low simmer until the venison became nice and tender. Of course, the vegetables will cook 
quickly. So I would put a lid on it and allow it to cook. And I'll just move this out of the way because I want to show you one that I already have done for you, as I'm sure you know. I always like to have one of them ready. And I want you to take a look at this while I get a nice bowl. I want to plate this up because I'm going to serve this with some blue corn dumplings. Now, blue corn dumplings can be made with any type of, uh, of uh, corn meal. You can go into some of the health food stores even and find blue corn if you can't find it right on your neighborhood shelf, uh, neighborhood grocery shelf. But I'm going to put some of this nice venison and corn and look at the pumpkin, all those pretty colors. And this would be served right onto the center of the table. And I'd put some of the little corn dumplings down inside. And these will almost be, if you can imagine, this will be just about like chicken and dumplings, but instead of having the dough, we'll have the blue corn. And feel free to use cornmeal, I mean yellow cornmeal. I'll decorate this with a little purple cabbage. Look how pretty that is. Now imagine this dish was probably being cooked in Louisiana, oh, at least five, six hundred years ago, but I'm sure some variation of that dish was actually cooked at Poverty Point. Okay, the next dish I want to do for you is, in my opinion, a very, very interesting game dish that probably, in fact, was cooked at Poverty Point, Louisiana. This dish is going to be a pot-roasted squab. Now, we know that the bones of pigeon and other wild ducks and any kind of fowl, a lot of wild fowl, were found all over the Poverty Point area. But squab was definitely found there. And you can get squab in any of the grocery stores today, not only whole with the bone in, you can also get them totally deboned. And this is a very fine red game meat. So you want to make sure that when you get them that you, uh, you remember, again, you're fooling with a game here in something that should take a slow braise to cook. And that's what I want to do with these little birds today. I'm going to season the squab, again, a little salt, a little pepper, and of course you can stuff the inside of the squab if you would like with some onions. In fact, I'll do that for you. Just put some chopped onions down onto the inside of them because that'll keep some nice moisture inside a bird. And I'm going to cook them with kumquat, so I'm going to put a little kumquat down inside of the belly of the squab. And then you can dust them in flour, as I'll do here. I'll just put a little touch of flour on the outside because that'll help get that nice uh, crispy coating on the outside as it sautés, but again, keep that nice moisture right into the, uh, into the squab. I'll also add just a little bit oil, and not too much, a little bit oil to sauté the squab. Again, a little flour on the outside of the bird, dust it nicely. And it's interesting that squab was found at Poverty Point because all of the early plantations of Louisiana definitely had squab pens where all the planters kept a nice uh, variety of different game birds, but squab and pigeon was always a major part of plantation cooking. So I guess squabs were just roaming the grounds of Louisiana, even in North Louisiana, 4,000 years ago, and they were plentiful, so the skeleton and the bones of squab were found in some of the ovens at Poverty Point. So I wanted to show this little dish to you. Now, once the squab's brown on the back, I would turn them over to lightly sear the front. You can see how quickly they brown. Look how just really quickly. And then, again, I would put some of the onions. We have to have that great flavor. Onions, some of the celery. You notice the ingredients have remained very simple in Louisiana cooking, all nice, fresh flavors. And then some green bell pepper, and of course, garlic. Now, I'm going to add a little garlic to this dish, right down inside of those, middle of those squabs. Of course, hey, use Cornish game hen. Use any kind of wild duck if you would like. Anything like that will work just perfect. You don't have to use squab even though I personally like the squad. Now, I'm going to add a little more of flavor to this dish. And the flavor that I'm going to add is Louisiana plum wine. In fact, is I'm going to add a little of the plum wine. Whew, boy, you talk about nice. Now, this will probably give us a little flame. 
Yep, it did. Then a little bit chicken stock. Because this is going to be a pot roasted dish. Now we're always talking about the Dutch ovens. This is a Dutch oven. We can actually roast on top of the stove in this old black iron pot. So we're going to do a pot roast of squab. So I'll add uh, the lid after I put a little bit seasoning to make sure that the oven is created right under that lid in this old black iron pot. A little thyme, a little basil, and let me add a few more of these great kumquats. I have to put more of the kumquats to give more of that wonderful flavor. Take a look at that, huh? Isn't that beautiful? Now I'll cover it up because I want you to look at what I have right here. I'm going to move it to this fire. Look at these little beautiful squab that's already done. And I want to plate these up for you. And the way I'm going to do it, I've got a nice platter here. I'm going to put some of this great Louisiana popcorn rice. We have a lot of varieties of rice in Louisiana. But this is a popcorn rice. I'm going to put a little bit of that right down into the center of my platter. And then onto that, I'm going to put my wonderful little squabs. Now, how can you possibly resist this dish? Of course, as I say, you can use Cornish game hen or quail, anything you would like. But I tell you, I would definitely try it. Let me put some of these wonderful kumquats right on top of it, and of course, just a little bit more of that wonderful color. Take a look at that dish. This is the pot-roasted Louisiana squabs with kumquats and plum wine. And please, be a, be a little creative and imaginative. Use quail or anything else that you would like. That's going to be wonderful. Something I would serve with that would be these magnificent little mandarins right here. And the mandarins are coated in Louisiana cane syrup, and it's just the perfect accompaniment to any type of game dish. So this is really, really nice. And uh, you can even serve this with a little ice cream at the end of the meal to make a wonderful finish to any game dish. OK, so that's squab and what? Little corn muffins with the venison. Let me move all of this out of the way. Now, I told you that I was going to have a great friend of mine come to visit me in the kitchen. And Dennis Labatt is, in fact, the manager of the Poverty Point site. And he's going to come on in and visit with me a little bit. Hey, come on in, hey, boy. Man. What you up to? It's good to see you again. Hey. huh? Yeah, Welcome. Thanks. Thank you. What do you have here? Well, it, I see you're enjoying an awful lot of modern technology here, but something missing in your kitchen is perhaps some prehistoric and, uh, technology. <laughs> so you're going to make me some yeah, tools? I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to make you a knife real quick. Uh, just taking a couple of pieces of stone. There's a couple of small ones Gee. there. Maybe one so, more time. So, you want to so, butcher with that one there? I tell you, if you take a look at this, the ash. Now, this is the way knives were made at Poverty Correct. Point a couple thousand years ago. Yeah. If you can imagine, no one can feel this, but I certainly yeah. can. The edge on this stone is incredible. This would have been used for butchering or Correct. or anything. I can beat your pocket knife by 200 times. That's the kind of edge you can create with that technology. And this would have probably been the exact way they did the, uh, uh, the, the, the points of the arrows or the Correct. Or yes. The Once you thin it like this, it's just a matter of using a deer antler to go ahead and uh, take it down, working on the edges. You know, Dennis, when I was visiting with you, we had an opportunity to do a little cooking the way Poverty Point Man did a couple uh, years ago, yeah. a couple thousand years yeah. ago. And I want to look at a little piece of tape that we uh, uh, shot. I want to share it with our friends. Tell, mm -hmm. tell me exactly what we're looking well, here, at here. Here, we're just digging a hole about 18 inches in the ground. Again, we have evidence of this style at the site. Here, we've taken our artificial stones. Uh, they're using a, about a variety of eight different shapes. You'll see the biconical layer. We're going to heat those. Now, to keep the heat directly off of our food, we're just using these cattail mats. Boy, do I remember that. Oh, yeah, using a big, broad leaf. Again, anything to retard the heat. Because in that cooking pit, we're talking temperatures of uh, eight, 900 degrees. Uh, and we think that our ovens at 500 is something that's hot today. But cooking in the ground with stones, those stones were actually made on the site, you said. Uh, right? Yes, that's just simple topsoil. We'd take the loose earth uh, using water. Uh, we'd reshape that uh, into a, a mud. 
uh, drying them out and then introducing them into the fire. Now what we did here, I put a piece of catfish, a filleted catfish inside of a really big, look like, look like a sycamore leaf, and then we wrapped it into the cattail mat. And then you're pulling the hot stones, as you say, 800 degrees. The green mat will actually not only keep the, uh, the, the, the fish nice and moist, mm -hmm. but being green, it won't catch on fire right. in there uh, yes. as quickly either. Yes. Uh, and I tell you, you pull the stones, the side of that bed, I remember putting my hand down there, the, the heat coming out of the side of that bed was just incredible. Now we covered it with uh, dirt because, uh, again, we kept the oxygen yeah. off of, the, uh, off of keep, the fire, right? To keep it from combusting. Uh, it also, the earth would act as an insulator. Now here it's uh, approximately 20 minutes later. Uh, it's about the length on a, on a fillet of that size. We were pulling out the mat here. So you're pulling your fingers back. It's still right. very, very <laughs> it warm. Hot. Uh, we'll pull it out and see if our fish is uh, cooked. And, and I remember thinking, you know, that uh, probably dirt would have gotten all over the piece of fish, but then with the, uh, uh, with the nice big old sycamore leaf on the inside, not only was the fish tremendously moist, but of course protected from all of the dirt. Once mm -hmm. I shook all of the dirt out, but you were telling me cultures eat a lot of dirt anyway. Oh, yeah. Early well, cultures even did. where you're grinding your food using uh, quartzite or sandstone uh, grinders, you're going to end right. up with 3 or 4% of look, uh, grit in your food. Look how moist that piece of fish is, if you can imagine. You can just see the steam and water. Look how it broke apart. Now, can you imagine 10 minutes in a wooden oven, I mean, in a, in a, in a clay oven, and that... That uh, uh, fish was cooked perfectly. Yes. So just, just amazing. Let me ask you one very important question that I know everybody out here wants to know, and that is, how was Poverty Point discovered? Well, uh, Dr. James A. Ford was actually working in Mississippi when uh, the locals there spoke of the things that could be found at this site in Louisiana, uh, in, in just by the hundreds. The artifacts, because this was on a farm. So he paid a visit in late 51, and that's when really the story begins. It's a very, very young story. What is the significance, in your opinion, of Poverty Point, uh, Louisiana? Well, when you consider uh, we enjoy some 10,000 years of cultural history here, uh, the early, early people were wandering, uh, living a very drab existence. There in northeast Louisiana is very different in that you were looking at a community of some 4,000 people that were gathering, uh, again, trading uh, from, with material, for material, from all up and down the Mississippi Valley. Quite an important religious center. Uh, normally it is accepted that cultures like this could not rise without agriculture. However, as we continue to unearth the site today, we're finding that, that this culture did rise without it. Hunting, fishing, plant gathering, and perhaps even horticulture, knowing the plant life, what was on the uh, landscape to gather from it. So people probably came from all around into that site. It was a major, major center. Yes. We're finding uh, some artifacts as far north as Kelly, Indiana, for example, some of the cooking stones. Uh, one of the pot-bellied owls that you mentioned earlier was found in a river in uh, east uh, Florida. So it had widespread contact. I found it very interesting that some of the samples of ore and some of the metals used in the jewelry actually came from as far away as the Great Lakes region, and this was all on foot 4,000 years ago, and the Gulf of Mexico, and as far away as Oklahoma and the Ozark. So it was a tremendous Correct. center, obviously, in those days. Yes. Uh, you'll notice it's no coincidence that a lot of our Poverty Point settlements are adjacent to the Mississippi Valley. Mm. And, of course, we would see that as, a, as an interstate for trade and travel. Let's take a look at some of the artifacts that you actually brought over. Uh, I want to definitely take a look at these and tell what they are quickly. Uh, here you'd see an example of the hematite or an iron ore. Uh, you can feel this. John, you'll see that weighs about a quarter of a pound. So they're excellent for fowling, uh, perhaps even the pigeon you cook today. Right. Uh, they were bringing them down, or other ducks or geese. Hung on leather cordage and thrown... Uh, it creates a web, which would right. entangle a bird. The gauchos like to use the bolo weights to bring down cattle today, using a pair of them opposite each other old hog time. Here we have examples of the cooking stones, uh, and, and on opposite ends of the spectrum here, you got one that's uh, very solid, uh, little surface exposed, and this one here really heavily grooved, which right. we feel like 
you're getting a variance of temperature. So, so different stones were used for different uh, This heats. one's going to hold heat longer, of course, than the one, right. uh, the groove type. Uh, I, I tell you, I'm so happy to have some of these in my collection, too. You gave some to me. <laughs> what I want to do quickly, and I want to continue to talk, but I want to do, okay. I want you to help me do a little dish okay. here, because one of the uh, dishes that were probably done at Poverty Point was a baked vegetable dish because they harvested mm -hmm. a lot of things. And I've got a butter bottle right there. Okay. So go ahead and take that butter. We're going to layer. And this is a very interesting dish for you to do at home because it's so simple. Oh, we're going to layer, yeah, right? Just go ahead and pour a little oh, butter over those vegetables. This is a pumpkin. And I'm going to put a little bit pumpkin around the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then season it with whatever you would like. I'm going to put a little salt a little pepper. In fact, you can even put some herbs down there. Then I'm going to come with some squash. I'm going to layer squash around the bottom of the vegetable uh, uh, mold again. And this will all be cooked a little bit more uh, butter or yeah, buttery butter. blend or one of the oils, low cholesterol yeah. oils. Just put a little bit on there again, a little salt, a little pepper. And of course, onions or anything else that you would normally use, you can continue to just layer it. I'm going to put some red and green bell pepper. Notice mm -hmm. how pretty this is. Food's got to look good as well oh, as yeah. taste good. And then some potatoes. Put a little bit more of the butter on it. Just put a little bit more mm -hmm. butter just but around mm -hmm. there around again. The right? A little bit salt and a little bit pepper. And then this would be covered and put into an oven to bake. Fact is, I've got some towels right there. Dennis, why don't you get the one out okay. of the oven that's already done? This would bake for about, oh, I guess an hour or so at 325 to 350 degrees to just present a beautiful vegetable casserole right onto your dinner table. And I want you to take a look at that once it's all baked and, and uh, it makes a wonderful centerpiece for the center of the uh, uh, yeah. dining room table. That's Dennis, great. I can't tell you how much we appreciate you being a part of this today. And oh. I'm going to come and visit Poverty Point just as uh, you've invited me to do. Please and I do. Wanna Make sure that all of you come back and visit again as we continue to cook up more of these great Taste of Louisiana. I want to try to sample yeah. some of it. Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Bruce's yams and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Chef John Foltz has written a cookbook that allows you to explore the exciting world of Louisiana cuisine. The Evolution of Cajun and Creole Cuisine is a full-color, 352-page book containing food history and recipes for gumbo, jambalaya, mock chou, and other Cajun dishes. For your copy, send a check or money order for $24.95 to Louisiana Public Broadcasting at the address on your screen. To use your credit card, call toll-free 1-800-973-7246 or visit our website at lpb.org.